Well, thanks everyone for uh, joining us this morning. We have a hard act to follow uh, after a series of ambassadors, but we'll try to do our best. Um, we've been tasked with the uh, topic of economic growth stagnation or worse. Um, I didn't write that title, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll live with it. But to tackle that, I think we're, we're uh, very blessed uh, to have a good panel here uh, where we've got basically two economists, um, uh, Sergei uh, Alexashenka from uh, now with Brookings. Uh, you've got uh, the bios in your packet and I won't, I won't waste time running through them. Um, and uh, Vyatislav uh, Inazemsev, um, who's uh, with the Center for Post-Industrial Studies in Moscow. Uh, and they're joined by two people with extensive business experience, um, uh, Peter O'Brien, uh, who's um, now on several boards, including, including Sibor, uh, and a private uh, equity investor, uh, and Trevor Gunn, who is now the uh, VP for International Relations at, at Medtronic, uh, which certainly does not do justice to all the uh, years he spent uh, working on Russia. We've got just under 75 minutes. I thought we would try to talk first uh, about uh, kind of a macroeconomic uh, overview, we talk a little bit about the economy, and then shift into uh, business and the attitudes of the international business community, of course, leaving uh, time for uh, questions from you all. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, on, the, uh, on economics, uh, we're blessed, unlike lots of other issues, to have numbers and facts on which we can uh, hang opinions. And I would just note that since 2014, uh, we've seen lots of opinions uh, and economic forecasts, uh, many of which seem to be motivated by where uh, the individual speaking happens to sit on the, uh, uh, the political spectrum. So we saw all sorts of doom and gloom predictions in 2014 and 2015 that the economy would track, uh, contract by 10 plus percent, uh, that uh, Russia was gonna drain all of its reserves. And none of these things uh, actually came to pass. And for those of us who are working on them, uh, they didn't seem to match with the facts and figures because I think what we need is a dispassionate policy uh, that's uh, fact-based uh, and looks at the numbers. And I think, like I said, we've got a good group here uh, to deliver some thoughts and insights um, on this. And I think to start, I'd ask Sergey to just kind of walk through um, uh, his views on uh, where we are uh, macroeconomically, and that'll set the stage for the discussion. So, okay, over thank to you. you. No, thank you. And uh, really, I. I don't understand how we can talk about economics without using uh, figures, numbers, charts. So, uh, though I have very limited time, I will try to run. And if, if I'm going too fast, please raise your hands and say, guys, slow, 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 slow. Uh, because I understand that for many of you, uh, all economic numbers and issues and charts will be not very uh, understandable from the very uh, beginning. But, uh, uh, to, start, uh, to start my uh, uh, ex explanation of what's going on in the Russian economy, I have to say that uh, it, is, it is in a bad shape, but it's not very bad. Because uh, economy, uh, economy is, uh, any economy is a very strange subject. Uh, an economy inside itself has a growth, uh, growth implemented, and naturally any economy of any country should grow. Because people want to live better, because people want to consume more, because people want to travel outside, inside the country, outside the country to purchase better cars and so on and so forth. So any economy should grow up. And if you look statistically on what's going on in the world, let's say starting from 1980 when we have more or less good statistical database from uh, the IMF, uh, you will see that there are very few cases when country is in a recession, economic of any country is in a recession for more than two consecutive years. Normally, country, if there is no war, if there is no civil war, if there is no uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union, for example, or crisis of 2008, the global crisis definitely was a shock for many European countries, for some European countries. But in ordinary situation, country grow, should grow. And that's why uh, Russian economy is growing, uh, but growth is very strange. That's what we have we, after the crisis of 2008. Uh, by beginning of 2011, Russian economy recovered uh, virtually to pre-crisis level. But nevertheless, immediately after that, the growth rate started to decline. And uh, in the middle of 2014, uh, before the most severe sanctions were imposed, when oil prices were $108 per barrel, 
Russian economy stopped to grow. So we can say, okay, sanctions, we can say oil prices, but nevertheless, it stopped to grow before that. Two years, eight quarters of consecutive recession, and once again, recession is over, and the Russian economy started to grow, and I would say growth is, uh, after that, is slow, nor it is below, uh, well below 2%, while the global economy is growing 4%, and Russia's emerging country should grow 4% plus, I don't know, 4.1 or 4.5, but nevertheless, it should grow more than 4%. Uh, growth is unstable, and to my understanding, growth is significantly statistically driven. Uh, I, I know uh, not a lot, but I know many things about statistics, and I understand that any revision of statistical data may change the previous data. But in Russia, statistics is done in such a way that any revision make you give you better and better picture. So whenever it is revised, investment, construction, uh, industry, GDP, households, incomes, any next revision provides you better and better picture. So uh, I cannot understand how the growth can be, can be such, such, such unstable as we have uh, after mid-2016, but nevertheless, it happens. Uh, what is the price? What is the price of the slow growth? <clears throat> On this chart, uh, you see I have two lines. First line, the upper line, is 4% growth per year. That is, let's say, Russia should grow, in my understanding. The green line is 2% growth. Let's imagine that uh, Putin is not ready to sacrifice uh, its his uh, uh, silviki or is, is not a fan of rule of law, and that's why Russian business has no incentive to invest, and that's why 2% uh, growth is what we have at maximum as the target of uh, the government for the next uh, four years. And so we can see that in, uh, in the last presidential term of Mr. Putin, starting from 2011, Russia has lost, of course it's statistically lost, approximately a, from a quarter to 15% to 25% of its GDP. So that is the price of aggressive war, that is the price of the poor investment climate, and of course, to a certain extent, that is the price of the low oil prices in 2015 and 16. Uh, <clears throat> what is interesting, what is interesting, what is growing on in the Russian economy? If, if you look, uh, you will see that it's a rather strange economy. Uh, this is, uh, the green, uh, green, uh, green uh, columns is accumulated, in, uh, accumulated share in increase of GDP of different sectors of the economy. And you see that the biggest impact is wholesale trade. Wholesale trade in Russia is uh, oil prices, oil prices, metal prices, because a huge chunk of profits and turnover of these companies, is, of holding companies, is registered in the wholesale. Then we have processing, okay, it's a military sector. Then we have transportation and storage, that means it's pipelines, it's uh, coal transported by railways. And then we have mineral resources, once again, oil and coal. And then what is really strange is uh, financial industry. I, I can understand coal. There is a big demand for coal, Russian coal. Russian oilers do all their best to increase oil production even under agreement with OPEC. But how can the uh, financial sector in Russia provide 9% of increase in GDP in two years while we have an epic failure of the banking supervision that resulted central bank invested 2% of GDP in order to save for private banks? So I, I, I cannot imagine. I, I, in, my, in my mind, it's, it's, uh, it's a great mystery how we can combine a, a tremendous losses in, in, in private banking sector that are accepted by the central bank balance sheet, and at the same time, the uh, financial sector may provide increase in GDP. And that's why I say that it is really statistically driven. But after that, after the financial sector, uh, we have government and defense, and all other sectors, okay, they are close, next to nothing. So it's really a very strange economy where we have grow okay, na or natural economy. You see, natural resources and commodities is the backbone of the Russian economy, and it's not a surprise. So nothing strange, nothing new, but it is a backbone that continue to, um, uh, to benefit the economy. Why, why do I believe uh, that Russian uh, economy is rather stable today? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, despite all what we can say about Mr. Putin, about his economic doctrine, about nationalization, about lack of privatization, so on and so on far, Russian economy is a market economy. It is based on free prices, and that is the most important factor. If you want to see what happens with non-market economy, look on Venezuela. 
Yeah, that is the economy that was market 10 years ago with free prices, with relatively free exchange rate. Nowadays, Venezuela is in the debtors, not Russian economy. Because starting from 2015, Russian Central Bank finally moved to the free floating exchange rate, and that helped the economy to find its equilibrium, to restore equilibrium much faster. And if in 2008 crisis, Russian economy lost 10%, this time we lost 3.6% of GDP only in the most prolonged recession ever. Then uh, uh, what is really, what was really different in, uh, from in 2015-16, that households were rather acceptive to, uh, uh, ex accept, the households were ready to accept significant decline in living standards. Minus 10% in real incomes, and no, uh, until last week's maybe, uh, no, until last uh, regional elections, no uh, visible protest and no visible disagreement with the policy. Uh, fiscal reserves of the country that were tremendous after uh, uh, boom in oil prices were used to finance military procurements and of course that boosted the military defense sector in the industry. The, in, on average in 2012-2017 military production grew from 10 to 15 percent year to year. And of course that uh, was uh, one of the drivers for the economy. Uh, last not least uh, is mother nature. Uh, oil prices have recovered and uh, for three consecutive years, Russia had good harvest. So that, that resulted economy to, uh, to uh, be uh, more stable and to recover rather fast. That's what's going with oil, and oil is definitely a, an important factor for the Russian economy. Uh, and you, you see that uh, oil prices started to recover, as well as ruble uh, is very correlated uh, to, to, uh, to the oil price. and. Uh, in the uh, last weeks, when we see oil prices coming up to $80 per barrel, okay, it's man, it means that the macro, macro stability of the Russian economy, balance of payments, exchange rate, uh, budget, they're all in very, very good shape. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, something has changed this year. And this something is new sanctions. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in 2016, 2017, uh, the sanctions policy was lacking, despite many sanctions were imposed on Russia, but sanctions needs to be renewed, to be messaging, and so on and so far. And starting uh, this April, a new wave on sanctions was very unpredictable, it was unexpected, and it was very strongly concentrated on one particular businessman who lost many of his opportunities, and Treasury, it's Alec Deripaska, and Treasury continues to press him, and that resulted that uh, in a very unusual situation when oil prices is going up, while ruble exchange rate is going down. So no, it's, that, is, that is the price of sanctions in the current run. We, it, it, we haven't seen, once again, we haven't seen this in the previous years. You see there's a very, very strong correlation between oil price and uh, ruble exchange rate. Nowadays, the situation has changed. Is it, is it long run factor? Is it uh, short run factor? I don't know. Nevertheless, in November, in the end of November, the new wave of sanctions uh, linked to the use of chemical weapons by Russia in the United Kingdom will be imposed. And who knows what happened that, that time. And uh, usually December may be the new months of some uh, financial turbulence. But uh, uh, looking, to the, looking forward, I have to say that fundamentals for the Russian economy are very good. Uh, and uh, inf inflation is historically low. The balance of payments and budget uh, uh, are strong because of the oil price. A uh, government is able to increase its fiscal reserves. The new budgetary rule is very strict, and the government is consistent in uh, fulfillment. In this fulfillment, all uh, budgetary incomes with oil price above $43 per barrel is going to reserves. And uh, um, by the end of this year, the overall fiscal reserves of the government may reach something like uh, 85 to $90 billion. And if we remember that in the previous cycle, when the economy was in recession, Russian Minister of Finance used approximately $15 billion, of, $15 billion per year, that means Russia will have resources for another five years of recession. So don't, don't be surprised that even if, or even uh, if uh, can, uh, someone, I know Peter can predict oil prices, he has a great experience, will predict your oil, oil, low oil prices for the next three years, nevertheless, uh, that, is not worry, that is not worry for the Russian budget. But uh, 
Uh, while Russia has good fundamentals, Russia, Russian economy uh, is lacking incentives. Investment climate is poor, uh, business is uh, undergoing nightmare, uh, uh, businessmen are going to jail, uh, Russian foreign policy is has no change, that means no hopes that sanctions pressure will be removed. Uh, in the most recent cycle, in the, after the presidential elections, uh, Putin uh, uh, announced his new economic plan that is based on an uh, idea proposed by his economic advisor, Andrei Belousov, who is well known as Gosplan-minded uh, person, who believes that the growth in the Russian economy should be state-generated. That the most important is a state-funded um, or state-promoted investment plan. That's why Russian government need, I don't know, 8 trillion rubles, something, uh, X amount of trillion rubles, and they should be invested, 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 and invested. Nobody where to invest, and uh, the most, uh, usually they say to invest in infrastructure, that's good, but uh, building roads, building roads along the Black Sea, building bridge to Sakhalin, uh, or some other strange economic projects when even Russian railways say we don't need this bridge because we don't know how to use it and it's definitely economic inefficient. But that is the idea of today. That is uh, Putin's uh, economic doctrine for the next six years. Let's try to promote economic growth by uh, state-funded investment. Um, uh, major risks, major risks for the Russian economy in the next, uh, in the in the current presidential term, uh, to my mind, all are external. It's oil price, it's global recessions, and it's a new wave of sanctions. I do not say I do not say any uh, serious reasons to expect that some economic turbulence may occur in Russia, because once again, as I started saying that. Uh, Ma Russia is a market economy, and I would say that in his 18 years in power, uh, Putin uh, did not try to undermine market principles. He, ne he, didn't, he never touched uh, freedom of prices. Moreover, he has liberalized prices for gas and electricity. This is very sensitive. And that's why he accepted the liberalization of the exchange rate. He accepted the policy of the central bank that uh, uh, the, uh, the central bank should not spend its foreign exchange reserves to support the exchange rate of the ruble. So I see that major risks are external, but that means that uh, economy that is market can accept any external shocks. Yes, there may be a certain decline by, by the road, but nevertheless, my forecast, my forecast for the coming uh, six years is that Russia will continue to grow one to two percent uh, per year. That is, okay, that is uh, not good, but as President Putin says, it's much better than some other countries. And finally, this grows, it's not recession. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sergey. Uh, can, uh, Vladislav, can I ask you to uh, pick up on whatever themes you'd like on where we are on, uh, on the economy and the outlook that Sergei has uh, put forward? And if you could touch on, I think, an issue that you have worked on before, which was uh, infrastructure. You certainly have proposed uh, infrastructure uh, development of Russia uh, in the past. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you all for inviting me here. Actually, in general, I agree completely with Sergei, uh, and I would say that uh, the prospects for Russian economy in the coming five to ten years is uh, definitely a stagnation scenario. Uh, but, uh, and I agree that uh, the economy is in a rather good shape, but one should understand uh, for what this shape is good. And uh, here it comes to uh, to the connections between the economic development and the political development and the political organization of the country. I would say that Mr. Putin uh, never was someone who tried to pursue Russia's, uh, Russia to develop. His agenda was not a developing agenda like, for example, for many uh, statesmen in the East Asia it was. It was rather a, a, an agenda for restoration and preservation. And in this case, I would say that he succeeded in what he wanted. Uh, so Russian economy is now definitely a market economy. Uh, it is managed uh, on the basis of international recognized norms and rules and principles in foreign exchange uh, sphere, in economic growth, uh, in how the Russian corporations behave both domestically and internationally. But nevertheless, uh, he succeeded in restoring uh, the Russian uh, economy somehow in the well-being of the Russian population during his first sec uh, and second terms. 
And actually, by 2008, by 2010, uh, this agenda was actually fulfilled. And then it comes to uh, price stability, because President Putin many times, uh, and every year, every day, he talks about stability, not development. And stability is actually what we have now in the economic sphere. Uh, economy is stable, it is not growing, which is you know, the essence of stability. Uh, it, promo it gives uh, every year, it uh, supplies a lot of money for, uh, for the gang or for the, you know, for, for, uh, for the company of Putin's friends who actually own the country and actually the idea of sanctions and the repatriation of the capital uh, back to Russia and the re-nationalization re of elites. It also goes, it, you know, uh, it, uh, it adds to, uh, to the new reality which, in, in which really the elite, the political elite, actually owns the country. And it owns and it gets more and more money in their own pockets. And therefore, actually, I would say that everything is going uh, in the direction that Mr. Putin wanted for years. Uh, if you look on numbers, I will not repeat what Sergei said. Uh, this year, 2018, will, uh, will end as the, mo the most successive year in fiscal policy because the Russian uh, federal budget is in green. It, it's, uh, a surplus of more than two trillion rubles by the end of the year. Even the oil price is not as high as it was in 2008. Uh, Russian government has a lot of uh, instruments, of uh, levers to boost uh, the government spendings. Uh, by the um, uh, depreciation of the ruble, uh, they can uh, channel more and more rubles, uh, even if the oil price is around 80. Uh, now the oil price in rubles uh, toppled 5,000 rubles per barrel in early September, while in the most uh, successful year, 2008, it was less than 3,600 uh, rubles per, per barrel. So in ruble terms, uh, the financial situation is very well kept, is very well managed. Uh, the government runs surpluses, uh, the reserves funds are growing up, and Sergei is actually absolutely right that the Russian government, the Russian elite can survive several years of consistent crisis or, or depression uh, in purely fiscal terms. Even during such, uh, you know, affluent times, they managed to, uh, to realize this pension reform or uh, the rise of the retirement age, which will definitely economize around from one to two bi uh, trillion rubles more uh, by the year 2022. So therefore, I would say that nothing shows that uh, the Russian economy can be ruined, either by huge uh, drop in oil prices or by sanctions. Uh, I, this is my personal opinion, but I would say that the, 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 the oil prices are inclined to go up in, in coming years due to geopolitical tensions and for, uh, due to many other obstacles. But nevertheless, the major point is that uh, you can, uh, uh, Sergei is judging the Russian economy from the uh, viewpoint of growth. Uh, my point is that the Russian government and the Russian leadership doesn't care about growth. They uh, care about stability and they care about the dividends. Uh, this stable and non-developing economy uh, gives uh, to their principal stakeholders, which are actually uh, the, the Putin's friends. Uh, I would say that the Russian economy is a kind of what can be called a captured economy, as, you know, as uh, analogous to the captured state. So uh, it's, it's captured by a uh, quite small group of people uh, who maybe not own it formally, but they manage them as if they owned it. And so therefore I would say that uh, the idea of development is not present. No one cares about the, uh, the business climate and the investment climate because it's also not, 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 not very necessary to, to, to think about it uh, if the main investor into the economy is the government. Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the economy is growing uh, not due to the rise of the uh, industrial sector as it was, for example, in once again in East Asian economies, but first of all due to the state-owned sectors the oil, uh, the oil sector, the state-owned uh, 
uh, military industrial sector, the infrastructure projects and so on. And so what we are now witnessing is uh, the emergence of a classical corporate state and uh, what uh, Mr. Beluso has done with the uh, profits of uh, metaphors in companies and chemical uh, producers uh, this summer was a good example of it. So you don't have a rule of law. Uh, you don't have, uh, you shouldn't care about the investment climate. You just care about control and you emphasize that everything uh, in the economy actually belongs to you. The major difference between uh, the Russian economy of early 2000s and the Russian economy of early 2020s, I would say, is that the oligarchs and the state uh, bureaucrats uh, in the former times, they profited from the financial flows which originate from either oil prices or oil, oil sector or um, a federal budget. But now it's a huge shift from benefiting from the flows to actually trying to own uh, the economy and the big parts of the economy. And now we have this day of, of, of solarization. We have this uh, maybe, it's not so significant now, but it may, may become even bigger, the repatriation of the capital. And ev on every level, uh, both the bureaucrats uh, and the businessmen, they try to have a grip uh, on the local, uh, local based assets because definitely the position in the outside world becomes more and more insecure. So uh, my point uh, will be, yes, uh, the second point is uh, that uh, is this economy normal or is it not normal? Uh, Sergei says that it's normal, it's market-oriented economy and so on. Uh, Ambassador Collins said that uh, it was a discussion about Russia's normality in early 2000 and now many people consider it's abnormal. I would say that I don't like this discourse at all because my point, it's not about it's normal or abnormal, uh, but more about is it contemporary or is it non-contemporary? Is it unmodern? Because uh, what is Mr. Putin is doing, both in economic and political terms, from my point of view, uh, he is taking Russia out of modern times, out of modernity, and bringing it back uh, to, the, which, uh, for example, in, uh, in Europe there is uh, also, which is, uh, his name is Richard, uh, Robert Cooper, uh, who's, uh, who talks about uh, the world divided into pre-modern economies or pre-modern polit political entities, modern and post-modern. So Mr. Putin is trying to take Russia from modernity to pre-modern times. And uh, one of uh, the distinguished ambassadors who participated in earlier se sessions, session, he said that, uh, I don't remember who, who he was, he said that Russia never experienced the borders uh, in which uh, it is stuck now. But no, it's, it's not true. It was in 1650. <coughs> and uh, all the political institutions of the country, from you know, the Institute of Holopstvo uh, to the Sobornyo of 1949, uh, to the uh, significance of Siberia and fur trade and oil trade, it's very much resembles the rush of 17th century before the reforms of Peter the Great. And this is what Mr. Putin wants to Russia be like these days. It want, wants to be not like Europe, not like the United States, not like the developed world. It, it takes it back but in all possible terms, in economic, in political, and in many others. So uh, what I, I would say he will do in coming uh, years, uh, as I see it. Uh, first of all, it will, uh, he will you know, drastically diminish and limit the social, uh, the, ex the welfare ex uh, expenses, like the pens pensions reform, uh, it will more and more, uh, the Kremlin will push more and more social related uh, expenses to the regions, uh, which they, uh, I would say, will not be able to, uh, to exercise in full shape. Uh, what Russia is doing in, in the terms of, you know, infrastructure development, it's, I would say, Mr. Putin is marking uh, the limits of his realm, of his territory. For example, if you look on the infrastructure in Russia, you will see there is no high-speed railway from Moscow to St. Petersburg till now. There is no you know, good roads any, anywhere in the country except Moscow, maybe. But at the same time, you have these new ports 
in Usluga in St. Petersburg, you have Nord Stream 1 or 2 and 2, you have Bridge to Crimea, you have new Olympic venues in Sochi, uh, you have some clusters in Chechnya, you have new space launching facility uh, in Khabarovsk district, in Khabarovsk region, you have uh, this uh, program of redevelopment Vladivostok and the bridges to the Ruski Island, then the bridge to Sakhalin, uh, the reconstruction of trans siberia Railway and then the Northern Sea Passage, everything is on the borders. There's nothing done uh, in the middle of the country. The most you know, uh, poor regions are concentrated around Moscow, maybe two, 300 miles from it. But on the borders, it's like you know, an investment boom while Mr. Putin wants to show that this is our territory. This is, you know, this is ours. Here we control this. What is go going up in the middle of the country? Uh, he doesn't care because he is obsessed with the idea of sovereignty with the idea of zones of influence, with the idea of you know, making Russia, uh, Russian uh, uh, borders strong. So my point is that we are now in a period which will not bring us and not give us any kind of you know, new developments. Uh, I am absolutely sure that Mr. Putin is present for life. Uh, and uh, that he will survive all these you know, uh, irregularities uh, caused by these uh, recent elections uh, quite well as, as he survived uh, uh, the problems of 2000 and the popular protests of 2011-2012. Uh, he thinks that uh, the state-owned economy is the best one economy one can imagine. And he has no any, you know, no any causes to, to change this course uh, he developed for years. Yes, he, he may be not very happy because of the sanctions, he may be not very happy because of the economy produces less money than he expected, for example, uh, and uh, there is some kind of dissatisfaction, popular dissatisfaction because of the drop of the uh, living standards, but nevertheless, he cannot change everything because once again, I will repeat and I will finish, but this, he is not a visionary, he uh, has no idea for developing Russia, he just has an idea to preserve uh, what he lost, what he thought it was lost in the 80s, uh, 1980s. And so, in this case, he's quite successful. Uh, first of all, his, on his own mind, maybe even in general. And that's why we will not see any, 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 any kind of changes. Russia will muddle through with uh, growth rates around 1%, nine, with three quarters of this 9% just make, uh, made by the statistical agency. Uh, and, and nothing else. Uh, and actually, I cannot see any, I would repeat any, uh, sources of uh, change in these trends except of a global financial crisis which can arrive in two, three years from now. But from domestic uh, points, I actually uh, would reiterate uh, Sergei's point that the Russian economy is stable, it's strong enough to survive a lot of internal shocks. And so Mr. Putin can feel himself quite safe. Thank you, Vyatislav. <clears throat> so that gives us you know, part of the picture uh, viewed by economists uh, both inside uh, and uh, outside Russia. I, I think to add another dimension to our discussion, we've got to talk a little bit about the experience of international business uh, and how they view the economy. Uh, I think I might just at the beginning uh, note how international business has responded um, to uh, the situation in Russia since 2014. And if you look at the major uh, European and North American businesses there, uh, you'll see very few of them um, have left the market. Instead, they've done basically <clears throat> what a lot of Russian companies did. They cut capex, they cut operating expenses, uh, and uh, they, they stayed in the market and protected their investment. <clears throat> the U.S.-Russia Business Council uh, most of our uh, large investors uh, were there before the 1998 crisis and certainly all of them before 2008. Uh, and one of the things they learned, which our two first presenters have <coughs> emphasized, is that the, Russia is pretty good at at least playing defense uh, and uh, managing uh, crises. Uh, <clears throat> when we look at, okay, uh, and certainly uh, nobody's going to diminish uh, that sanctions uh, have certainly uh, had an impact. Uh, at the same time, uh, there certainly has been, uh, have been new investments. And if I just look, I just named uh, three projects since 2014. Uh, Abbott Labs bought Verifarm, 
which is the third largest pharmaceutical company uh, in Russia uh, for about uh, 300 million. Uh, if you look at aerospace, um, Boeing this month uh, opened uh, a, an expanded production facility uh, in the Urals, representing another 80 billion, uh, 80 million or so uh, in the economy. Uh, we also have uh, Schlumberger, uh, which I think is on the verge of actually getting a major stake uh, in Eurasia drilling. So it's not like there hasn't been stuff uh, going on at the same time. Uh, and, you know, the investment climate is all how you look at it. Uh, if, <clears throat> if you look by the numbers, uh, and, and, you know, you can always uh, game out any of these, uh, you know, s statistical indices, uh, which has been done to some extent. But certainly Russia now rates as 35th on the World Bank's ease of doing business, uh, 38th uh, on the World Economic Forum's uh, global competitiveness. Uh, so there's some positive part there. That's not to diminish the other part, which I think we've got to talk about in the discussion, which is about the lack of competition in the Russian economy uh, and the size of the state sector, which, at least from my perspective, are some of the major issues. And if you look at these same competitiveness indexes, you'll see that Russia ranks very low on competitiveness, both domestically uh, and uh, foreign. But in terms of looking ahead, uh, I think why don't we first turn to Peter O'Brien, who has uh, lots of experience in the economy, to give us his perspective. Okay, thanks, Dan. I think uh, a couple things I wanted to talk about. I think I initially came into Russia more in a capital markets related role for an investment bank. And um, it's been somewhat sad to see the level of capital market activity, both by domestic Russian companies and foreign investors. Uh, over the past few years, obviously, with sanctions. And, and two main trends, I think, have developed, which are interesting to talk about. First is, in terms of raising new capital, um, it's clearly gotten a lot harder, because uh, the environment uh, outside of Russia, looking into Russia, is so polluted by the sanctions and other debates. Um, and it's, it's really quite difficult now for a Russian company to do an IPO. Um, if we think back to the period of 2004 through 2008, there were large deals that seemed happening every month, uh, from Novatech to Sistema, Rosneft, uh, and others, billions and billions of dollars. Um, today, uh, there are fewer, but some good stories, uh, whether they're smaller domestic consumer-related growth stories, or even a large industrial story like Sibur. Um, that would like to go out into international markets and raise equity. Uh, but I think uh, what you're really seeing is a number of uh, smaller deals where some existing shareholders of existing companies are able to sell stakes. Um, and you might see a few smaller uh, 50 to $150 million IPOs. Uh, and they're all being done for the most part, maybe a couple exceptions. If it's clear you're very far from the sanctions universe, uh, being done on the Moscow Stock Exchange. Um, and I talk about one in, in particular that's likely to come in, in the next uh, year or more, um, and it's a company called Subor. It's a large petrochemical uh, company with, uh, frankly, a fabulous management team. I would say that as, as I'm a representative on the board, but um, they are a team of professionals in their 40s that have spent time in different places around the world, have extensive project management expertise, um, and are very ambitious. Um, and they have been evaluating a potential IPO for some time. And it's clear to them uh, that there would be great interest, including from the fidelities and capitals of the world. But because of the sanction environment, uh, would likely probably have to do it only through Moscow, which would mean the, the deal might have to be smaller and the valuation might be different. Um, Second uh, point I'd like to talk about briefly is share buybacks. And ironically, I think when many of us were involved in, in the development of capital markets in, uh, in Russia in the 90s and 2000s, we would have all said that you know, having a more diversified ownership base, um, including international investors, would be a good thing for the growth of any economy. Uh, ironically, everything that's happened in the last couple of years is resulting in many companies choosing to uh, consolidate ownership of their shares, to buy their shares back uh, in the marketplace because their companies are so lowly valued by international investors and they also have some excess liquidity because 
uh, the economy has stabilized, that they're buying their shares back. And uh, you're seeing many companies now announce this over the last six to 12 months, which means you know, the consolidation of ownership and ownership mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago uh, by the elite, if you will, is just becoming more concentrated, which uh, is, is ironic. And then the, the third thing is I'd just like to talk a little bit about projects. I think, um, and Dan already mentioned a couple, Boeing and, and some others, but I think it's in my time there, it's, it's become evident to me that there's a growing group of professionals in Russia who have experience either overseas or with Russian companies working with uh, uh, potential uh, subcontractors or others that can help them execute large capital projects. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think the environment, uh, whether you're a Russian uh, company or a large international investor, I think is much better uh, today. And if you are willing to come with capital and have a plan to invest um, and provide jobs and contribute technology that is not sanction risk technology into the Russian economy, um, I think today you'd be really amazed at how well you'll be received both at the senior federal level but also at the local regional level. And it's much easier to navigate getting something done, uh, whether it's because you can find lawyers and you can find folks that um, drive your, your path into the relevant government approvals. Uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean it's a, it's a good, a much better conversation you can have today than we would have seen uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, because these regions and Russia generally needs this investment, needs the jobs, and they've figured that out. So coming in uh, with a project to do, I think you'd, you'd be surprised at how warmly uh, you'd be welcomed. Thanks, Peter. Yep. Trevor, you've certainly been involved in this market since we were there uh, together in the 1990s. Um, could you give us your, your thoughts on uh, keying off kind of what Peter said about uh, where things stand today and sort of a snapshot in how international business looks at the market. Right. I mean, Dan, it's been been quite a ride, depending upon where you are and particularly which in industry you're involved in. And I think that's, you know, uh, perhaps the most uh, important thing is, I mean, there's some generalizations that can be made, but it really uh, makes a big difference, you know, sort of where you are, what your strategic position is, what your strategic appetite and long-term vision is for the country as well. Um, uh, most people don't know my company, but uh, Medtronic is the world's largest medical technology company. Uh, we make about 168,000 medical uh, technologies. Um, we're large and, and I would say relatively new to Russia. Not, uh, we were not that active in the Soviet times. Uh, but we definitely, uh, I would say that the, the medical and the pharmaceutical sector, to give uh, two, uh, I'd say, relatively relevant examples, have been relatively unscathed. Um, I've talked to my colleagues in the pharmaceutical sector, and I talked to my colleagues on, in the medical technology sector. Um, yeah, generally speaking, the, the, the story is one of relatively stable seas. Certainly, there are you know, bumps in the road and that type of thing. But you go to other sectors uh, of the economy, uh, and I talked, and we benchmark what we do. In, I, I, in my job, I deal with 160 countries. So we're all constantly benchmarking against what people do in different markets. Um, certainly in the IT sector, uh, some, some, some colleagues there have been suffering a great amount. And, and one of the reasons are because you have uh, uh, viable local alternatives, uh, potentially, or you have Chinese alternatives, whatever the issues may be. But the substitution, the ability to get in and substitute for Western type technologies is, is actually really, really quite high. In the pharmaceutical and medical technology sector, not so much, not so much. Um, generally speaking. So I think that, that the story is, 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 is a very, very difficult one. It's not got any easier over the past year, I think, as some of my colleagues were mentioning. It has been uh, sort of a tightening environment. Um, and I guess we'll talk a little bit more about sanctions and the exact, but, but think about, uh, you know, I don't know how many people really look in a disciplined way at sanctions, but you know, you look at individuals, you look at entities, you sometimes you look at regions, and you sometimes you look at industries. Right, and you can almost determine where a person is going to be relative to their impacts over the past year and, and even beyond by looking at their exposure in those in, in those in those four dimensions, which of course aren't, aren't unique. They could be actually overlapping, uh, but that certainly provided um, a lot of extra uh, reconsideration uh, for, for people's strategic plans, 
um, within, uh, within, uh, within the Russian economy. Um, we as a company continue to be very positive. I mean, uh, demographic trends uh, in Russia um, speak in our industry's favor, uh, unfortunately. Um, Why? Uh, fortunately. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say unfortunately. <coughs> unfortunately. In your uh, favor? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, we're in a human, uh, humanitarian industry, is, is so, uh, depending on who's asking. Um, uh, and, and the reasons that ask him, but I'd say fundamentally, it's, it's sad that Russia has not made more progress down the demographic, uh, in, in, in the dem demographic uh, dimension. Uh, but yet, Russia has played a very, very constructive, probably the most prominent international role in terms of non-communicable disease. As an example, several Russian colleagues have, on a global scale, made really huge international contributions. In fact, we have an NC NCD gathering in, in uh, at the United Nations this week, and, and the Russians are very much ahead. In fact, the top global health official in, uh, at the WHO, in fact, is, is a Russian doctor um, that's, that's dealing with these issues. So um, progress, not so, but, but so the fundamentals in our business are, are still quite, uh, quite stable, and we take a very much a strategic view on the Russian economy. Uh, others, other industries, may take a more episodic or transactional uh, view on, on the Russian economy, and, and that's certainly their prerogative. Um, and, and as thus, you know, some of the cap CapEx and OpEx expenditures you talked about, Dan, um, are, are very, very real. Um, you can't take these type of declines uh, for a very long uh, time, so, yeah. Uh, thanks, I might, uh, just before we turn, uh, turn to a few questions here, just say a couple words on, on sanctions, which were, I think, uh, well covered uh, in the first panel, but to give a little bit of a, a business perspective on this. I just mentioned three things, I think, uh, and I think a lot of the business people certainly I deal with uh, do have a strategic long-term view of markets, uh, not only Russia, but global markets. Uh, and when they uh, take an objective view of uh, sanctions, they have a couple of questions. I think the first is, you know, is there a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis, um, other competitors from uh, Europe and Asia? And particularly, uh, I think, uh, with the European Union. And when you look at the uh, sanctions design of the, uh, the Obama administration, certainly you had a very much a, a multilateral uh, sanctions approach uh, with the European Union, which of course is Russia's uh, largest trading partner, uh, which I think helped uh, to build uh, a, a level playing field that uh, uh, people could deal with. Uh, the second issue is the reliable supplier issue, which is one we don't talk a lot about um, <clears throat> publicly, uh, which I think is a shame. So if you're, let's just say you're a Russian company, and a private Russian company, uh, and you're looking at buying uh, e equipment, machinery, or technology, uh, uh, which is only available internationally. Well, when you look at U.S. suppliers, U.S. companies, you've got to ask yourself, am I going to be able to get the maintenance and spares I need five years from now to continue to use this equipment, which I think is probably best suited uh, for my industry? Or am I going to try to diversify my fleet of vehicles or technology or computers uh, and add in some Asian and European mix as a hedge. And the latter is what a lot of people are doing. So when we talk about unintended consequences of sanctions, uh, that's certainly part of it. The other thing is people have kind of a long-term perspective. And when we find that we go around in the executive branch here uh, and uh, to members of Congress and their staffs, we find a, a, an understandable, very tactical approach to deal with what they perceive as immediate threats to national security, uh, which nobody, nobody is minimizing here. But at the same time, Russia is not going to move off the planet. And how, you know, as, we, as our government and our Congress deal with these very real uh, national security threats, how are they planning for the future uh, to, to engage, uh, particularly, uh, you know, with the Russian people uh, and with the Russian, uh, particularly private sector business community? And when I see issues like, for instance, uh, privatization, uh, which one of the uh, provisions of CATSA basically uh, prohibits um, uh, U.S. persons or entities from uh, participating in, uh, in privatization, what that means is it's probably going to slow down the growth of the private sector, which I think we all, uh, I, I don't even have to ask, everybody thinks <laughs> is a bad thing, uh, given how much of the economy is in is state hands. 
And at the same time, who's going to be able to participate in these privatizations? It's going to be Chinese, uh, Asians, um, and is that necessarily a good thing for the long term? I think these are just kind of questions that should be uh, in, the, uh, in the sanctions debate uh, along with everything else. Um, but I'd just like to ask uh, one question to our economists and then one to our businessmen. And the first one, I, I think, uh, Sergey and Vyatoslav, you very, uh, very well covered in a short time as sort of the economic outlook. Uh, but the, the question is, what about consumers? What about you know, ordinary Russians? Uh, we all know that the extractive industries have provided the main source of revenue. But when you had that big bump in growth during uh, President Putin's first term and thereafter, you had a big growth in consumer confidence uh, and consumer-driven growth. And when I look at the numbers right now, if I look at you know, uh, Spare Bank's uh, Ivanov um, uh, Consumer Confidence Index, I see it down despite slight uh, raises in, uh, recently in uh, real uh, disposable income and real wages. So I'm just wondering how you think consumers look at this. And of course, this is against the backdrop of the very unpopular pension reform, although I can't name a single country or place where pension reform has ever been popular. Um, but if you could, the two of you could just have a quick comment on that. Sure, Sergey. OK, uh, look, uh, there is no average Russian. Mm. Let's start with this. Uh, because Russian, Russia is a diversified country. But two thirds of Russian families, they have no financial savings. So Russia is not, is not consolidated. Two thirds of Russian families have no even small banking deposits. The median income, in, okay, the average salary in Russia today is something like 43, 45,000 rubles. That is something like $700. That's average. While median, is $400 only. That means half of population receives less than $400 per month. So it is, and people who are well below average, who are median, below median income, they, they survive. They survive and of course, of course they benefited something from Putin's first decade from 7% growth, but normally those are not people who are purchasing cars. Those are not people who are receiving mortgages. There's no people who are traveling abroad. They survive. They survive in Moscow, not a lot of them. They survive in, survive in Chukotka, in Khabarovsk, in Vladivostok, and all over the country. So uh, when we say that, yes, the decline in households' incomes during the last recession was strong enough, 10%, and it was bigger than even in the crisis of 2008, that's true. That's true, but once again, it was not dispersed equally. For example, the consumption, the, the sales of new cars declined twice, you know, 50%. That means, okay, people started to renew their cars not every three or four years, but every five or six years. Is it really declining in living standards? No, it's a decline in consumption. Yeah? So that statistic is very different, and uh, I would say that, uh, once again, we have to look very carefully. There are a lot of people wh whose consumer sentiments are very bad, and they are even uh, worse in the most recent terms. And pension reform, uh, yes, no, n not a lot of countries are happy because of pension reforms, that, but the main, uh, more, uh, the main uh, momentum, uh, negative momentum in the Russian pension reform today is that it is not fair. It's not the issue we have, Russia country has to raise a pension age. It was discussed for maybe a decade, and more or less many people have accepted this. But it is not fair. Because for ordinary Russians, pension age for men increased by five, eight, for women by eight years, while m militaries, securities, they have pension age of 40 to 45 years. <sighs> Can you imagine this? And uh, the, the average pension of Russian citizen is uh, 14,000 rubles per month, while the average pension of the bureaucrat is 74,000 rubles per month. It means five times more. Is it fair? And nothing has changed. So, Sentiments are very, very poor, and I think that the uh, results of the uh, most recent uh, elections and regions, they demonstrate that people are not happy. And that is real, like we, in Russia we say it's a battle between fridge and TV. And the most recent round of this battle is won by the uh, fridge. Consumer sentiments are very poor. Thank you. Get a slap and check yeah, I, I will uh, add, uh, I, in general I agree with Sergei as well. 
Uh, but I would say that the problem with um, uh, real disposable incomes and about the uh, consumer sentiments is has another a little bit other uh, dimension because if you look uh, if one looks on the Russian economic growth of Putin's first and second term between 2000 uh, and 2008 2010 uh, you will see that uh, the very huge part of this growth uh, as a factor in GDP originated from, diff from several industries, which were actually the banking and financial sectors, uh, the retail trade, uh, the service sector, uh, the mobile communications, the internet services, and something like this. It was not originated from the industry. And the biggest problem uh, for the development of the Russian economy in general is not only the uh, stagnating disposable incomes, but the issue is that all these areas, for example, retail trade or residential construction or uh, penetration of the uh, mobile uh, communication are actually saturated these days. And you can't grow by uh, double-digit uh, rates uh, in 2018-19 uh, as they grow in early 2000s. And so therefore, even there are more oil money coming into the country, they don't have enough uh, places, enough industries, branches to be invested in and to produce uh, the uh, uh, multiplication effect. So I would say that this is why the government now wants to invest a lot of money into infrastructure will, which will never pay off because <coughs> actually the, the market, uh, the, the, the consumers cannot you know, make uh, an economic effective use of this money. So therefore, I would say that uh, it's, of course, it's a big problem with, with the consumer sector and it's a big problem with the incomes, but uh, for pushing economy uh, you know, forward, the government should first of all, of course, initiate a program of something like the Japanese government made in the 1990s and, and early 2000s, pumping a lot of money into the consumer sector, lowering taxes, making a lot of um, uh, you know, um, available loans for, for, for the people just you know, to, to, to encourage consumption. Nothing like this is done in Russia. And the second point is, of course, you should somehow uh, ease uh, the bureaucratic pressure of the economy. It's not about you know, to internationalize or to lift sanctions or whatsoever. You just should somehow uh, develop uh, the local, the domestic uh, investment uh, opportunities and investment intentions. But once again, nothing is done in this direction. So therefore, I would say that once again, the pe it seems to me that the government is simply, uh, simply not happy with what is going on and they don't want to change anything. That's my point of view. Thanks, Vyacheslav. And if I could ask Peter and Trevor, just in terms of looking at the, uh, the business climate as international investors, uh, I mean, which puts you in a very different, uh, different position. Uh, for instance, Russia has a Foreign Investment Advisory Council, uh, <laughs> which brings uh, CEOs uh, into contact uh, you know, directly with the prime minister and the ministers uh, on issues they have uh, with business and the business climate. So, I don't know, maybe we'll start with you, Peter. Just, just a couple of words on how you see um, the business climate right now or where you think it's going. Sure. No, again, I, I, think, um, um, I think the doors are, are clearly open if, if companies are willing to come in and have identified a sector of the economy where there is demand for their product and they actually want to invest, build, and provide jobs. Uh, I've heard too many stories lately across industries, whether it's... Uh, even auto, uh, one auto company that will go unnamed has a senior management member now who came in from China not too long ago and is now running Russia. Um, and I, I won't say exactly what he said, but the comparison was very favorable uh, towards Russia. I think the issue is if you're not above a certain scale and you're a smaller player, right. I think it is much more difficult uh, because raising capital at that level is more difficult getting the doors open that you need to um, is more difficult. But if you're a large uh, multinational bringing technology jobs and, and investment, I think you'll be met with infrastructure, support, clear regulation, uh, clearer tax regulation than you would have had 10 years ago. And, and I think um, if you believe in growth 
with the investment boom coming, going from one and a half percent a year to maybe three or four, um, and the oil price staying above sixty dollars, uh, and thereby the ruble not being too volatile, um, it could work out. But those are all those are all substantial ifs. Thanks, so. Trevor. Yeah, I mean, it seems like we're largely agreeing with each other. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like it, um, and, and, and it's not intentional, it's not coordinated, but I do actually agree with Peter. Uh, but I would say that I agree with him in a macro sense, right? All the, the fundamentals, the doing business ranking that Dan mentioned to the type of things that you're talking about, Peter, very much, uh, they are very real. It's, it's, it's a relatively stable business environment, and we do business in 160 countries, we know what instability actually looks like. Um, and. Russia did, Russia did not all bear the, the traditional hallmarks of, of, of an unstable, unpredictable business environment. But when you look at the micro transaction that you're actually doing, the micro variables that go into an actual transaction, it has become a significantly more difficult. And I'm not saying it's, it's not something we take any joy in, but you start with sanctions, you have to do counter, you have to really know your partners in a way that you never did in the past. You do significantly more due diligence in terms of holdings, cross holdings, so that you don't run afoul of, of US or, or Western law, as an example. That takes a tremendous amount of commitment, often a lot of capital, and you still don't necessarily always have the, the, the answer that your board actually may feel comfortable with. So that's, that, that is a different layer of scrutiny that is now in place that, uh, I mean, uh, you know, obeying U.S. law is not an option for, for most publicly quoted companies, and uh, it, we are one of those, um, uh, it, you know. I would also just simply say that it's, it's very difficult with the headlines in the United States as they now are to get people actually aligned to your business plan. You're going to get a lot more questions from a lot. You're going to get them from senior management in your company, you're going to get them from people inside and out, out, outside of Russia, you're going to get them from shareholders that you didn't actually expect. Um, and, and that is, you know, makes life just a little bit more difficult to make that case. Um, it doesn't, it, it's not the case you have to make around trade, meaning export XYZ for us, medical devices, that's, it's, it's a clear case, customs, get it through customs. It's, it's not long-term in nature, but when it comes to the larger, larger and strategic things that we would like to be doing in Russia, it certainly has become uh, more difficult. It doesn't mean that we're not committed. We certainly are committed, but, but nonetheless, that's you know, the extra layers of, of things that we need to go through as companies that you know, we wish we did not um, have to go through, but we do. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, in the time we've got remaining, open it up to, uh, to questions here. So, yes, sir, right in the front. Thank you. Thank you all for a very interesting uh, panel. Uh, I want to push. Uh, could, could you identify yourself, please? Sorry, sorry. Dan Treesman, UCLA. I, I want to push Sergey and uh, Vladislav a little bit to uh, speak more uh, about this image of, of the Russian economy that they presented, because it's a very consistent picture uh, stagnation, but not crisis, stability, but not growth. Uh, and uh, as Vladislav suggested, this is perhaps Putin's goal uh, to avoid growth, to, to freeze the current situation. Uh, and, and the real uh, point is to continue extracting rents uh, for Putin's friends. Uh, and I think I heard you both say that the main threat to this is external, or the only mm -hmm. real threats to this are external, some kind of international financial crisis or a oil price shock. Uh, but as a political scientist, uh, I'm familiar with literature which shows that low economic growth uh, tends to increase the odds of overthrow of the leader in an authoritarian state. Uh, of course, there are exceptions, but there is a general pattern. Falling incomes or uh, slower growth of incomes associated with more protests. Uh, we've talked a bit about the pension reform. Could, could we kind of get to the question? I'm, I'm sorry, we're a little short on time. Yes. No, uh, well, my question is, has Putin missed something? Uh, is this a stable political uh, strategy as well as an economic strategy? Mm -hmm. Maybe unfair to, to ask you to talk about the politics. We'll get to that this afternoon. But uh, what do you think? Uh, I, I, I think Putin has no strategy, neither in economics, neither in foreign policy, neither in domestic policy. Putin has his own, as he sees, destiny. 
his destiny to be, he's a messiah. He's a messiah sent by the Lord to keep power in Russia, to rule Russia, and to transmit what God sends to him to the whole Russian population. That's his, that's his vision of himself. He is rather tired of being leader of the country. He doesn't listen to a lot of people who doesn't want to meet with his ministers. And he, uh, I, I disagree with Vladislav that when he says that current state of the economy is Putin's goal. Putin has no goal. <laughs> Putin <laughs> has satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the economy. Uh, let's imagine he, all his troubles, US, Syria, Ukraine, protests, and so on and so far, you have 5% of your time dedicated to economy. And you have the only one question that worries you. Do you have money in the budget? If yes, there is no problem. In his previous 18 years in power, Putin has found a very easy instrument to solve economic problems, just to pay money. And it worked. It worked in 2005, when there were protests against monetization. It worked in 2008 in the crisis, when he increased pensions, and so on and so far. So, at the moment, Russia has huge fiscal reserves, and every, mo every Monday morning when Putin calls to Minister of Finance Shulwanov and asks Anton Germanovich, do we have some funds? Yes, we have Vladimir Vladimirovich. How much? As you wish. So, and he is happy. That's the only one question. He is not worried. I agree with Vladislav. He is not worried with 2%, 5%. Of course, it's, it's not good when Russia is in recession. But 2% is okay because we have plenty of money in coffers. So that's his economic vision. And he don't care about anything else. Yeah, I, uh, in responding to <coughs> your question, I would say that uh, I differ, my, my approaches differ a little bit, differs a little bit from Sergei's. But in general, I would say that yes, uh, I, I think Putin has some strategy. But nevertheless, uh, he miscalculated only one point uh, in, in current years, I would say. And this is the pension reform. Why? Because the problem is <coughs> that if you look, first of all, about authoritarian regimes and about the lack of economic growth, the authoritarian regimes, they are very different from each other. And the Russian authoritarian regime, I would say, is one of very few which has absolutely open borders. And uh, as, uh, as more people go out of the country which are dissatisfied, the regime becomes more stable. And uh, if, if we were in the Soviet realities, uh, in, in the Soviet times, it, it would explode many times. But now you can, you know, you can pump all the uh, people who are dissatisfied, who, are, you know, who are tend to take uh, a stance against the regime, you can send them abroad, they can squeeze out, and uh, the pressure inside is, is, is lowering. But at the same time, if you look on the post-Soviet regimes, like Ukraine or Belarus or Russia, you, you can see that there were a lot, several attempts of re revolt or dissatisfaction, uh, as it was in the first and the second Maidan, as it was in Belarus in 2010, as it was in Russia in 2011, but all of them were caused by political uh, issues, uh, by some kind of injustice uh, in, in domestic policies. And no one, actually, was caused by economic problems. Why? Because, as I am explaining, because, for example, the falling uh, exchange rate of the ruble, or growing taxes, or the falling oil prices, they affect everybody. And this is you know, the, the idea of it's, in a, it's economy stupid. It's, it's, it's economy, and it's objective. You cannot uh, you know, abstain the, 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 these issues. They, they're affecting everyone. And if something economic affects a portion of the people, this can be a, a, a devastating. This can have a devastating effect for the popularity of Putin. This was the monetization of uh, 2005, and this is a pension reform because not everybody, like for example, in uh, VAT tax uh, hike, in this case, everyone is, uh, you know, is affected. In pension reforms, some part of the society is affected, some part is not, and as Sergey said, it looks as it is very, you know, unjust uh, in, in, in many aspects. So. This was definitely a mistake. And I never predicted this because I'm absolutely sure that if you push, if you put 150 billion of rubles, 200 billion of rubles per year into an excessive transfer to the pension fund, this is not a problem for, for your tenure. For me, for me, it's a very clear sign that Mr. Putin wants to stay after 2024 because if he hadn't had this intention, 
Till 2024, the pension reform is not a problem at all. You can fund it easily. Moreover, there is, you know, the pendulum in, uh, in demographic trends. And of course, there is the effect of very low fertility in the 90s, these days. But in 2000, the fertility was, uh, had, go, had gone up. And in early 2030s, the, uh, the generation which will enter the labor force will be more numerous. So this is a, a, you know, a temporary problem. You can solve it by pumping more money, but Mr. Putin decided in another way. So this is actually a big fault for him, both politically and economically. Thanks. We'll cut into your lunch hour a little more and see if we can take a couple more quick questions here. Um, <clears throat> yes, sir. Hello. Um, Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your deep insights, and uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, Mr. Dinas Butners, uh, MSFS graduate here at Georgetown and now with the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my question is actually kind of touches on Sergei's uh, great mystery with regards to how is it that the financial sector is contributing to the GDP of the country. Um, looking at the banking sector in particular, it seems that as of early this year, in 2018, over 300 Russian banks have lost their licenses. Uh, of the top 10 institutions, uh, four of them have been consolidated and under state control, and only one really stays totally private, and that's Alpha Group, or Alpha Bank. My question then becomes, since it seems that the Russian state is moving into the financial sector, or at least two-thirds of it, and nobody really wants to say the nationalization word, does this uh, seem to be that the Russian state is trying to uh, pad the coffers, or is it really trying to see one last uh, sector of control for the Russian economy if it plays into capital uh, in terms of raising funds for finances? Thank you so much. Sergey, here. Uh, if you ask uh, the chairman, chairwoman of the Central Bank, Elvira Naviulin, is it the policy? She will definitely say says no. If you ask Mr. Putin, is the nationalization of the financial sector, of the banking sector, is a policy, they will say no. Nevertheless, uh, currently, 3-4, 75% of Russian banking sector is state-owned. I, I would say that two biggest, and the only, maybe the only two biggest Russian investment banks, they are owned by state-owned bank. So the financial sector is going to be more and more nationalized, and it happens day to day. To day. And that is... Uh, that is not an idea, that is not a desire. But every time when there is a question what to do, the leadership, the, economic, the government, the central bank leadership, the president, they choose an option to be more state-owned, to be more state-controlled. And of course, they find different good arguments why should it be done. Uh, when 75% uh, of the banking sector is state-owned, that means there is, okay, all good clients, they are going to the state-owned banks. Yeah, and that means the state-owned banks, they are able to give lower deposit rates for the uh, households and lower, deposit, uh, lower credit rates. So they absorb better clients and lower risks. So private, private banks, okay, out of, the, out of another 25%, uh, the rest of 25%, approximately 10% is owned by foreign banks. And it's very specific niche of the business, and I don't think that anyone can compete with them there. Another 15% 15, 15 of the banking sector is private-owned. And so all good business in the state-owned hands or foreign banks, and what private business should to do in the banking sector? Okay, semi-legal operations, gray operations, more risky. I see the future of the private business, banking in Russia. They, it will disappear mm -hmm. sooner or later. It's only a question of time. Thanks. Um, Ariel, last question. Hi, Ariel Cohen of the Atlantic Council and International Market Analysis. In our consulting work, we're looking at uh, the Vazrajdeny, uh, the Atkritsia Bank, and the uh, Prom Svez Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, there are allegations in the open sources about massive fraud, uh, with up to two hundred million dollars being siphoned off overseas. Uh, how do you see the banking sector as the investment agent in the economy, not only as a saving uh, mechanism for the Russian population? Do you, do you think that the direction the, bank, the banking system is going can sustain the quasi-private character of the Russian economy? Or as Sergei Alexashenko suggested, 
it's moving towards nationalization. And if it does, does that mean the banking system will not be an instrument for um, capital flight and money laundering? Thank you. Yaroslav? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> no, okay. I, 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 no, I, 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 of course, I must start with this issue. Uh, I, I think, I think that, um, uh, of course, two hundred billion dollars is overestimating because central bank injected in four banks two trillion rubles. That is approximately thirty, thirty three zero billion dollars, and its uh, restoration of capital plus. Uh, okay, okay. That means. Look, uh, Ariel, it's a question when. Uh, when the bank in Russia has losses, and uh, those losses exceed its capital, and bank has a negative capital. Is it only fraud, or is it banking supervision? To my mind, first of all, it's banking supervision. Yeah. Of course, there may be fraud. I don't know. It may be, it may be not. But if one bank after another, and all big banks that became bankrupt, despite nationalized or not nationalized, all of them have negative capital, that means no capital minus something else. That means it's a problem of banking supervision. If there is no banking supervision, only state-owned banks can exist because they receive different type of subsidies from the budget, one way or another. Private owners of the bank, they cannot survive with permanent losses. Yeah. That's it. Okay, I just have one quick question for the four of you as we finish up here. And uh, I think we're all in violent agreement uh, on uh, the current state of affairs. So my question is, where, what could be a driver of growth uh, going forward? Uh, and I'd put forth my uh, own two cents worth that uh, I think uh, President Putin's uh, pasta uh, in, in May, his, uh, his series of decrees, headline decrees, uh, which could result in some estimates in $120 billion in investment through the end of his terms in infrastructure spending is, is certainly one possibility for growth. But I turn it to you. Peter, we'll go to come right down. Dan, that would have been my first one as well. I think um, uh, there's a lot to do, and let us mention this internally on roads and infrastructure. Um, and I think I, I just myself drove the road, the new road up from Moscow to St. Petersburg this summer. Um, and as you do it, you see communities along that road becoming more accessible and it's actually it's a great piece of new road um, so I, I think that has to have uh, some benefits uh, going forward so. okay got a slot no I, I can't see any source of growth because uh, you know uh, as our colleague said it was a part of the road which is building for which has been built for 20 years so far and it's not finished yet and uh, the problem is with the infrastructure spendings is that for example during his speech on the 1st of March, uh, Mr. Putin uh, said that it will be an increase uh, of spending for new roads. Uh, they will increase it by 11 billion rubles uh, for six years of his tenure. But he never says about the kilometers or miles of road built. It's, uh, it speaks, he speaks only about how much money he will uh, allocate to these issues. But uh, in early 2000s, the, uh, the money allocated to this Issues were three, four times less than now, and the quantity and the length of roads expanded by four to five times you know, more than today. So you can spend trillions of rubles, but you will have no results at all. So all the, uh, even, look, uh, it's a very interesting idea, it's a very interesting point. In, in the Russian, I would say, planning system, then there are a lot of programs uh, you know, and strategies unveiled every year, but you know, in contrary to the Soviet experience, when after five-year plan, it was, you know, some kind of, uh, of results provided by the Central Commission of the Communist Party or the Communist Party plenum, now no one strategy or program is finished by the year it, it was due to. Two or three years prior to this year, another one is adopted. And no results are ever published. So therefore, I, I actually doubt that the, for, uh, that the state, uh, you know, state uh, investments or state managed investment can uh, provide uh, any kind of economic growth. Actually, okay, Trevor, you I see. Mean, neither do I see a real catalyst for for growth. But but let's put it in context. 
look at what's going on in Turkey, Let's look at what's going on in Argentina, look what's going on in Venezuela, how many odd other uh, emerging economies in the world, and somebody said it pretty well, which is one or two percent ain't bad. <laughs> Okay. Last word? It's definition of growth. If, if you are talking about growth 1% to 2%, Putin has to do nothing. If he wants 4% plus, he has to resign. <laughs> <laughs> and on that happy note, uh, thank you all. Thank, thanks to the audience.